Well, hello. My name is uh, George Brusiker. I'm a researcher and I work on uh, formal ontology and semantics. Uh, and I work at the Center for Cultural Informatics uh, at the Institute of Computer Science and the Foundation for Research and Technology, HELAS. And in this short presentation, I want to talk to you about uh, the concept of data heterogeneity. So, what we were going to look at in this uh, short discussion is what data heterogeneity is, why it would matter to a digital humanist, uh, what causes it, uh, look at some examples uh, of how it comes about, uh, and then talk briefly about what we can do about it. So, uh, to get to the point, what is data heterogeneity? Well, you could say data heterogeneity is the incompatibility of form of digitally rendered information. Translating in a different way, that just means that if you have something that you want to express uh, in a digital form uh, using a technology like uh, Excel or a relational database, uh, you have to express it in some way. Expressing it that way, choosing these columns and not those columns, making these tables or those tables, can create an incompatible form between two data sources. That would be data heterogeneity. I've also written here, data heterogeneity exists when one or more data source holds information about the same or related topics and would be of value to consider and process together, but the manner in which they're structured impedes the ability to do this. So translating that another way is just to say that uh, it's fine for two data structures to be incompatible uh, to use together uh, if they're not talking about the same thing, but if you have multiple data sources, an Excel, an Access, uh, a uh, library catalog, that are giving you data about the same research topic, uh, and you want to be able to look at that information and process it in an efficient uh, and uh, consistent manner, then the fact that they're in different forms, that they have this data heterogeneity, is a problem to you. So this uh, 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 visualization of that, so you have a world of, uh, of interest, and you have three sources uh, that are talking about it, but their shape, their form is different, uh, so they're incompatible amongst themselves, so you can't build an integrated view that would be uh, the connected information uh, from all sources together, uh, giving you the maximum data on your topic of interest. So why should data heterogeneity concern a digital humanist? Well, I would argue that data, its creation, use, and reuse is at the heart of digital humanities. So efficiently handling data heterogeneity is a significant part of the research task of a digital humanist anyhow. When you start gathering data together, you have to ta tackle the task that if there exists data already, uh, that you have to uh, reformat this and reuse this uh, in an efficient way. Uh, another reason to be concerned about data heterogeneity is that in order to produce referenceable results that can be critiqued, scrutinized, and reused by other scholars, you have to have uh, some sort of strategy for managing uh, the data, data heterogeneity and putting your data into a form uh, that is compatible with other people's data and is well documented uh, so that it can be reused, critiqued, uh, and brought forward. Um, I also put this little slide together because I think uh, it's another way of uh, thinking about why we should worry about data heterogeneity. So as we uh, follow specific uh, topics of research, uh, we build up data structures uh, that allow us to express information about a certain aspect of the world that we're in interested in following. So as digital humanists, we'll create a form, we'll create an Excel, uh, and we'll describe uh, some part of the world. And you spend a lot of your time uh, entering research information uh, into these systems. Now that data uh, could be of interest to a colleague, uh, but it being expressed in an incompatible form makes a barrier between you and, and your colleague uh, and uh, fellow researcher. So you can end up stuck in your own world where you have data that is talking about the same world as a colleague, uh, but you're unable to share it across, uh, and so the maximal efficiency of research is not being re reached. Uh, and furthermore, because your data, if you haven't thought about making your data somehow more generally compatible, more standardized, expressed uh, in, in a way uh, that is well-grounded and known by other people, uh, then your research results uh, in traditional publications don't link back to uh, formatted sources and don't allow other people uh, to really go back to the primary data and uh, investigate uh, the ground of your claims 
which uh, ideally is a step that we would reach to. So uh, that's what is data heterogeneity. Then the question comes, uh, where does data heterogeneity come from? Uh, so data, data heterogeneity comes from a lot of sources. Um, I've identified four main categories here. So we have different types of actors working with data. So it could be, and so it could be the scale of the people working with the data. Is it an individual researcher? Is it an institution? Is it a consortium? The fact that actors have access to different resources, have different amounts of time, all of this uh, will impact on your ability to build data structures and your ability to put uh, standards into effect. So that affects how we build data structures and therefore how heterogeneous our data is. Um, furthermore, uh, in digital humanities, we could be studying anything. Uh, so the object of our study uh, also obviously affects uh, that which we want to record, that which we want to study, and that being the case will affect the kinds of data structures we build. So if we're looking at uh, a text, obviously we'll build different information structures to if we're looking at a site or a building. This is another cause uh, of creating uh, heterogeneous data structures. Another factor uh, in this is uh, tools that we use. So just by adopting a certain form uh, of a software or a hardware for processing data, uh, we uh, might produce different results because we have, uh, because it's commercial software and uh, the supplier has decided that the information will be structured this way. We just have to work with that, that's a given. Uh, or uh, because we've chosen a relational database format, it means that we'll do something different than if we structure something in an Excel, for example. And last but not least, uh, the matter of goals in your research obviously affects data heterogeneity. So of any particular subject of research, you could document anything in the world about it, but having a research goal means that you will uh, be creating information and recording uh, uh, elements and features about your object of study. These elements and not those elements because some elements are more relevant, some are less relevant to you. So how does that look uh, more or less in, in reality? So if we think about uh, an individual researcher level, uh, we have some topic of uh, study, I haven't defined it, but it's a world that we want to investigate. Uh, it's a pretty normal scenario now uh, that you would come along and you would find pre-existing data uh, that you want to reuse. Uh, if it's expressed in a spreadsheet, a library catalog, there's a GIS system that describes some spatial elements, somebody else, you've created your own relational database documenting uh, the information that you find is of relevance, and increasingly people create 3D documentation. All of these things could be talking about the same world, but unless we figure out some sort of way of standardizing and harmonizing uh, our data across these different forms, uh, we're unable to get the maximal, most efficient uh, uh, recall out of this data that we would want as researchers, both individually, but also to share with other researchers into the future uh, and making sure that our uh, research is accessible and uh, critiquable. Um, just some other examples, there's also pressures for data heterogeneity at an institutional level, even within one institution. The fact that you do different specialized tasks can lead you very, very much to decide that you need to use a tool that's incompatible uh, with, another, uh, with another section of an institution. So here, I've got the idea of a, of a museum, which would have a registrar team, uh, a library related, curators and researchers, an archival team uh, dealing with the archival data and the conserva conservation team. Now each of those uh, groups of actors could have their own motivation for applying a data standard that's uh, applicable and appropriate to, to their craft. So EAD is the, uh, uh, a main archival standard. That's an appropriate standard uh, for the archival team to take up to document the main information that's related to the museum's collections. But it's completely inappropriate to documenting uh, museums' collections where they might adopt a standard like uh, Spectrum uh, 4.0. So there are real relevant reasons for creating data heterogeneity, uh, which we then have to fix uh, at a later point uh, where it's possible and at the appropriate stage. Um, and one last example from the real world is that uh, more and more institutions and researchers uh, get involved in larger uh, projects at a national or European level uh, and they work with external partners 
And so uh, the fact that you want to uh, work, for example, with a, a well-known aggregator like Europeana means that you have to create another expression of your data, uh, which is another piece of the data, data heterogeneity puzzle. It's, it's a good piece of the puzzle. It allows you to share data, uh, but it's yet another standard that's out there that you have to create a compatibility with. You might work with a business uh, uh, partner if you're in a museum and want to get data from the Christie's catalogs of what's been bought and sold over time. Um, so you have, and then if you work in a project, they might choose their own ad hoc uh, standard, which is necessary for that project, which again commits you uh, to creating more data structures, more diversity, and you have to figure out how to solve that. So, what can we do about data heterogeneity? Um, I think uh, the point to make, the basic point to make, is that data heterogeneity is not going away. Uh, it's a natural part of how humans work. We are interested in investigating different parts of the world, and for that we will have to create different information structures. Uh, so the goal is not to create one standard or one way of working uh, that will uh, manage them all, uh, but rather to figure out strategies uh, to create data harmonization and data integration uh, as and where it's needed. So this is actually a positive problem uh, that we have so much information from so many sources. How can we bring it together to achieve the central aim of uh, humanities and digital humanities by extension, which is knowledge uh, grounded in these uh, ancient traditions of knowing thyself. So, um, what are ways to successfully try to mitigate data heterogeneity? Well, there's more than one way. Uh, so, many ways are schema standards and semantics or ontology. So, what are the use case scenarios for those? Uh, a schema standard says, if you're working uh, in this domain, uh, we are archivists or librarians or museum professionals and we've created groups together and we've decided, we've, we've had a lot of conversations, and we've decided this is a good way of documenting X. Um, so these are good to adopt if you're in a limited context uh, where you can make agreement with the, the actors in question and you can get a political force behind to enforce the fact that you will do these things this way. Um, so it's useful for more limited contexts and in domains uh, that are relatively standardized and closed and people agree on the professional practice. On the other hand, uh, if you're working together in more interdisciplinary, uh, more uh, intra-institutional uh, environments uh, where the possibility of a common agreement of the ways to do things is not possible, where the political will won't happen anyhow, um, then you have a situation where the data is heter heterogeneous at source and there's no way to stop that. So, uh, if that's the case and your teams are, di are, are dispersed, uh, then that's the point where you should begin to start thinking about an ontology, which would be a way of mapping different standards, hopefully, to start with standardized data, into a larger common framework. Uh, so let's go a little bit uh, deeper into those two solutions. So, yes, you should use standards, uh, standards like Europeana, perhaps, or TEI, or the Carrar Project uh, Metadata Standard for 3D Objects, or EAD for Archival Standards, uh, Dublin Core. Depending on your mission, if, you have a, if you're working on a particular topic, or you're working with uh, the same kinds of actors, uh, then this prescribes a practice to you, it gives uh, the same one standard for one topic, uh, it's a pragmatic choice, it meets a goal, uh, and it works. But it's not a general solution for data, data heterogeneity, it's a good solution for uh, one particular area of research where everybody agrees. An ontology, on the other hand, uh, is uh, a data structure which abstracts uh, over multiple different data standards, or even unstandardized data, and tries to look at the general terms and relations that are used uh, in those uh, ways of documenting things and creates a abstraction layer over that which describes all of the different possible data forms in a certain broad domain uh, at a more general level. And the point of that is to create a sort of lingua franca uh, which would allow you to take data which remains at source diverse, 
So it's in this sort of Excel format. It's in that kind of relational database. It stays that way because those are the tools that people want to use. Uh, but at the sharing level, you decide we're going to take that data and map it to this common abstract standard. Uh, and you can re-express the data into what's called RDF. Uh, it's one of the standards or, uh, for formatting the data. Uh, and then you would be able to get a global view over multiple data sources that are heterogeneous. Uh, and then I haven't touched on one topic uh, which gets uh, which is very relevant to the topic of data heterogeneity uh, and can get confused with ontology, uh, so I put it in here. Uh, the question of what role do thesauri or vocabularies play uh, in the question of data heterogeneity and uh, data integration. So uh, when we talk about uh, schemas, standardized schemas and ontologies, uh, what, we're looking, what we're looking at is the data at the level of the structure. So I decide I'm going to record my data in about tables, chairs, and cats and dogs in five columns, and you decide I'm going to use a relational database and use two tables. Those are heterogeneous structures. Uh, and if we want to make them harmonized, we could use an ontology to say these things match in this way. A thesauri is not at the level of the structure of the information, it's at the level of the values of data that you put into uh, the data structure. So I'm in my Excel column, and the Excel column says uh, type of thing, and I write table, or I write table, or I write tafel, uh, linguistic examples, but it could be uh, other variants. At that point, uh, you also need standardization on how we'll call things. Uh, and that's where thesauri and vocabularies uh, can come in and help you create data standardization. So anything that can be, can be or is classified by specialists uh, and, is done and has been done in a systematic way uh, can be uh, harmonized using a vocabulary, so, uh, or also known as a thesauri. So I put some examples here. Uh, Getty, for example, makes a series of thesauri for um, art and architectural terms, uh, for uh, place names, uh, for artist names. Uh, the FISH standard is uh, a standard coming out of the UK for cultural heritage. Uh, the Library of Congress gives many different thesauri but on subjects. Uh, GeoNames is another uh, standard list of names uh, for uh, place locations. So uh, that's where that fits in uh, to the data harmonization story and the data heterogeneity story. Um, so uh, back to the notion of uh, standards and thesauri and uh, ontologies coming together. This picture here uh, is kind of the uh, dream of how you build a semantic network. Uh, so at the bottom, uh, we have different data sources that are talking about the same thing, and they're structured in different ways. So they're heterogeneous. But hopefully they're using a standard, so one is using uh, EAD, and one is using Dublin Core, and one is using uh, a different standard. So we take those, and we can link them uh, to a top-level ontology like CDOC Sierra. So that gives them a new structure that is compatible at the top here, uh, and then we can use thesauri uh, to go down to the level of the terms that we've put into the data and standardize them. So if I say tafel and you say tablet, uh, that we get, uh, that the system knows that these are one and the same thing. Uh, and that creates, in the middle here, what we call the integrated uh, knowledge network or a semantic knowledge network, uh, which allows you to query everything that's down here via one information structure system. And the point of all this is to support interoperability between mutually relevant data sources, to enable sourced and verifi verifiable facts from data sets, um, to enable referenceability of and reusability of data, and to foster structured argumentation on top of facts. And last but not least, uh, I just wanted to uh, reiterate the point uh, of how ontologies, schemas, standardized schemas and thesauri come together uh, to help mitigate the data, data heterogeneity problem, which is never going away, uh, but is only something we manage. So on the one hand, uh, when we start data projects, if we have uh, new recording and we have new research that we want to do, 
uh, we should look for some standard schema if it exists and try to uh, use that because it probably has some built-in knowledge that people uh, have uh, generated over time through committees and what have you. So it's good to follow what people have already thought through. Where possible, uh, adopt existing thesauri for describing things, unless you're doing uh, radical new research, in which case you have to build your own thesauri. Uh, that's a very uh, relevant thing to do. Uh, and then uh, ontologies come in at the end of the process if you're working in a multi-team uh, multi system or somewhere where you're not able to enforce uh, one way of looking at the world, then if you need to share data uh, amongst different teams, uh, you can map your different data systems to one ontology uh, and thereby create a single data structure to analyze your data.